All right. So welcome, dear sisters. My name is Dr. Evelyn Sikwera, and I'm the founder of Sacred Lotus Womb Academy. As a part of this Mind Your Mind Lady, these are free webinars that I'm uh, kind of doing. We did two topics earlier. One was the effect of hormones, the female hormones on our brain structure and neurogenesis. And what is the kind of diet and lifestyle that supports neurogenesis, that is creation or formation of new nerves and neurons. And uh, the second topic was on what is the power of the subconscious mind? Again, taking from teachings of many teachers, and uh, it's not one particular teacher, but today we are going to, you know, going to look at our own nerve cell or neuron and just look at the anatomy, very simple, maybe what you would have learned in biology class and must have forgotten, and even I had forgotten, so I, I was remembering it as I was preparing for the session. And what is, what is a cell? What is in the nucleus of a cell? What are chromosomes? What is DNA? And what are genes? And why I'm doing this is because, you know, most of us here are on our spiritual path and we keep hearing in most of the work that we do, oh, we have to, you know, get the 12 standard DNA in place. We have to uh, work with our genes. We have to heal our, you know, there's DNA healing using uh, different frequencies. We hear these words, but we don't know what it means. So now it is important for us because we are intelligent women. We also need to understand what is this part in our biology and just understand it just enough because if you look at medical textbooks, the, the set the is like this thick. We, we are not doing all of that. We are doing just enough for us to understand the working of these different cells. Because when we undergo trauma, when we undergo uh, our subconscious mind is under the power of all the old beliefs and patterns, it is the nervous system which is affected. So understanding the nervous system biologically becomes very important. And uh, keep your questions for the end of uh, the session. And uh, I'll, I'll put it now. Uh, I'll just share the presentation so that you can see the slides. So I'm going to share my screen. Moment. All right. Okay, let me begin with the first one. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming for the class. So today's class is reprogram. How do you reprogram your subconscious mind? Most of the today has been taken from one more teacher. His name is Dr. Bruce Lipton. Uh, kindly mute yourselves, everyone. You know, do your own work so that you just, no one has to kind of monitor you. Yeah, all right. Uh, Today's flow is very simple. We are going to learn about the neuron. Neuron is the nerve cell, okay? The structure and the function. We are going to learn about synapse. Don't get frightened with all these words. They are very, they sound very funny, but they're actually simple. Chromosome, gene, DNA, telomeres, and finally, ways to reprogram your subconscious mind. So let's start with a neuron. Is it visible, everybody? Can you see it? Is it visible? Is it clear? Is it not clear? It is, it is Perfect. visible. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. All right. So if you look at a neuron, this is the this is the neuron, okay, which is a nerve cell. It looks very different from a regular cell. You will see that it has a, a central portion, which is, uh, you know, the bluish or the grayish in color. And there is Another red uh, or a, sorry, there is a dark blue point or a lighter, a darker shade of blue in the center, which is the nucleus, the central point of the cell. Now, this cell has lots of branches coming out of it, and they are called dendrites. Now, these nerve cells or neurons are found all across the body, but this particular one is mainly found in our brain. So, these are all dendrites. So but just, just let's look at the structure first. Then we look at the function. So we'll name the parts, the nucleus, and this is the cell body or what we call the soma. The dendrites or branch-like uh, appendages that are coming out 
of the cell body and one particular appendage is very long you can see it right it's very long and that is called the axon and what it's covered with is called these little uh, orangey structures they are called it's the myelin sheath okay this is mainly a lipid or maybe a sheath made up of fat and protein and you will see that the sheath is not very complete okay what the the sheath here is uh, it has these sp spaces in between and those spaces are called the nodes of ranvier just to remember so ranvier was this guy who found this out so his uska naam aa gaya and then at the end of the axon is what we call an axon terminal so they are like finger like processes at the end and right at the end of each of these fingers is a little blob like structure which is called the synapse okay so i'm just naming the structures here we have the cell body we have dendrites which are like branches so now look at this as a tree okay just that but your imagination you will have to use it differently these are the branches the dendrites are the branches look at the cell body as the trunk of the tree and this axon think of it as roots okay i'll tell you why later now i'm just going to uh, you know i've put in a little bit of theory here but i'll quickly read through it so a neuron is also called a nerve cell now nerves and blood vessels are different nerves are those through which your sensory impulses and motor impulses are passed blood vessels are those through which blood flows okay so know the difference first there are two types of neurons you have sensory neurons and motor neurons sensory again we won't go too much into the details of it and when many nerves come together like we saw one nerve cells so like this many cells come together they they uh, conglomerate together and they form what is called the nerve now neurons are structural and functional units of the nervous system now nervous system is very important for us especially for us on this journey of uh, being able to uh, manage our body our physical body our emotional body our spiritual body having a control over the nervous system is important and that's why we are learning now these neurons are fundamental units of the brain it's the same thing again now what these cells are doing they receive a sensory input from the external world that means now suppose you have we have nerve endings even in our fingertips now suppose you've taken a glass of water okay or a cup and the temperature is very hot as soon as you touch it the signal that there is high temperature is immediately passed from the nerve cell you know and then that whole impulse goes back to the brain to a particular part of the brain that is able to sense and retrieve a memory saying oh my god it's touching hot hot danger and immediately you you release your hand or you immediately you know put the glass down on the table now this is happening in nanoseconds okay the impulse is received the sensory input is received and the command that input goes to the brain and then a command comes back which is a motor command which is actually doing an action is releasing your hand from that glass saying that this is too hot release it it will harm you so the nervous system is basically designed to protect you okay now like i said the dendrite is like a tree branch the axon are like the tree roots okay and the soma is the tree trunk now just it's it's so beautiful don't read the words just look at the diagrams okay so we have now how do these cells communicate because it is we don't have one nerve cell we have many neurons in our body so how do they communicate now when you put two nerve cells next to each other we saw there was a nucleus then the dendrites that axon and that axon had these finger like processes okay and when you bring another nerve cell the nerve the other nerve cell ka dendrites are waiting to receive information from these axons okay so there is that terminal called synapse and there is a synapse at the end of the dendrites as well and this is how they communicate 
So they don't really touch each other. In some neurons, they touch each other, the ends. But in some neurons, there is a space in between. And that is how they communicate. I'll show you exactly how they communicate. So this is, again, two cells. And you see how they are joined. Now, if you look at our brain, and if you look at the whole nervous system, you have millions of cells like these, and they have formed like a web. And it can, to give you an idea, like how we have the internet, the World Wide Web, through which the electrical impulses are passing, our nerve cells are exactly the same. Sensory input, motor input, all this is happening. Okay? So this much, this much you have understood? Is, is it clear? Right? Very good. And hold your questions for the end. Okay? I'm not reading about the action potential and all of that. Okay. Oh, let's look at... You know, when we saw the two, uh, the two ends, okay, the axon terminal and the dendrites, when they meet, where they meet, it looks like this on an electron microscope, like two, you know, two bulbs coming together, but they are not touching each other. And can you see in between these little, you know, like little vesicles, like little bubbles there? Now that whole pro that whole thing there is called the synapse this is where the electric nerve impulses are passing from one neuron to the other neuron now how are they communicating how is one neuron sending a message or sending a signal to the other neuron there are two ways that it does one it uses a chemical process and the second it uses an electrical process okay now pay attention to this what does it do in the chemical process? Don't look at all the theory part. Just look at this picture. So now this is one of, this is the axon terminal and this is the dendrite terminal of the other nerve cell. What it does is there are these little vesicles that are formed and inside them we have what is called neurotransmitters or neuropeptides. You must have heard of dopamine. You must have heard of histamine. Huh? I'm different. You know, we hear of these neurotransmitters. We hear, uh, you, you must have heard about adrenaline, noradrenaline, big words, you know, which we use when we describe nervous system. So these are all the chemicals which are present in these small vesicles. Now, based on the sensory input, which is coming to the neuron, that particular neurotransmitter gets filled in this vesicle and it gets released in this space. We remember the previous picture where I, sh where I showed that there is a space in which it gets released. Now, the other, the other neuron, the dendrite, the end of the dendrite, has got channels. Okay, they are like little, you know, little doors there. So once these neurotransmitters are released, the other side now picks up these neurotransmitters and it is the neurotransmitter which has come like a letter from the other one or a courier and it tells, okay, this particular neurotransmitter means this is the problem and we have to pass this information further ahead, okay? So I hope you understood this part of the chemical neurotransmitter, very simple, okay? Some signal is coming and every signal Different types of signals have different neurotransmitters which are released. I'll give you a list of those neurotransmitters also. Okay? We're not going too much into the details. Then we come. So the neurotransmitters, they have different names. They are amino acids. Okay? Like glutamate. You may have heard of GABA. Okay? Uh, you may have heard of glycine. Then there are some things called dopamine, serotonin, which we learned about last in the first first class where we said when certain signals like when we have estrogen and progesterone working uh, on the brain cells on the neurons then serotonin is released now we know how it is released and where it is released okay then we have something called acetylcholine no need to remember all of this but what you need to remember is certain signals release certain neurotransmitters, okay? And what does acetylcholine do? It is important for muscle control, 
uh, learning, memory, attention. Then we go to uh, adrenaline, not adrenaline. Let's not do this now. Then we have something called neuropeptides. So they are just, again, these are chemical substances. When you have a signal, okay, that there is, uh, you know, you're cutting, you're cutting uh, vegetables, okay, and you get a cut on your finger, okay, immediately you're like, ah, oh, you know, there is cut, there's bleeding happening. But now the pain, there is a signal, there is an input which has gone to the brain saying that there is pain that has happened because of the cut with the knife on your skin. The brain gets the signal that there is pain. And immediately that pain signal releases a neuropeptide called endorphin, okay? And enkephalin, which is known to inhibit pain. So the actual amount of pain that one receives is quite high, but because immediately the brain releases these neuropeptides, these neuropeptides like endorphin and enkephalins, the pain threshold is low. I mean, it comes uh, where you don't feel so much of pain as much as you would have felt it, okay? There's something called substance P also and neuropeptide Y. You don't have to know about that, okay? So these are neuropeptides and neurotransmitters. Now, why this is important for us to know? Again, knowing which signal is causing which neurotransmitter to be released. So serotonin, dopamine, now we know dopamine is a big one. Whenever you achieve any goal, okay? Now suppose you have decided, I'm going to wake up in the morning and go to the gym or go, uh, go for a walk. As soon as you achieve that, it is a message to the brain that she has achieved her goal of going for a walk today. And that releases dopamine. And that is the, and dopamine gives you a sense of feeling of accomplishment. Why do people keep raising their bar whenever they set goals? Like somebody who wants to climb Mount Everest will not go to Everest first. First, they'll go for a hike, you know, ghar ke, ghar ke you know, just behind their house. Maybe they'll go for a one hour hike and then they will build up. So little by little, when you increase your goals, you are increasing the amount of dopamine that is released. Now, dopamine is also released when somebody has, you know, maybe an al maybe alcohol or uh, takes something, uh, some of these uh, uh, substances that can give you a high. That also gives a feeling of accomplishment. And then over a period of time, that dose is not enough for you know, that amount of dopamine does not make you feel high. So what do you do? You increase the dose of alcohol. So first 30 ml was enough to get high. Then you need 60 ml. Then you need 90 ml. And over a period of time, the person has become an addict because the person wants to feel good. So feel good uh, or a feeling of accomplishment comes with the neurotransmitter dopamine. And now we know where it is getting released in our nervous system. The second type of synapse. So we saw these two kind of, uh, you know, uh, spaces where between the two cells, the communication is happening. One is a chemical communication and one is an electrical communication. Like it's a direct electric signal. There is no time for, uh, you know, for releasing a chemical and all that. No, no time waste. So this is what is called um, direct signals. And this is done especially in cases where uh, we want the sympathetic nervous system to act. That means whenever there is a predator, like if there is a tiger in the room, you're not sitting and thinking, oh, let me decide the tiger is going to eat me, not eat me. No, there is no time to think. It is immediate that there is a tiger. This is a threat to my life direct the, the the signals between the nerve cells is fast like cut 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 it's like you know it goes so quickly to the brain and says there's a predator run no time to even think and imagine okay so this is where electrical impulse comes into play now imagine dear women every day we are faced with predators who we have created in our 
in our subconscious mind. Yeah. And these predators can be, uh, you know, images of maybe a parent who was very critical to you or somebody like a father or a mother or a caregiver could have been a boss. So we have these predators all around us. Now, imagine the amount of electrical, the amount of electric impulse that's running through your body at all times, every time you see this particular person or you come up with an event or you're fearful about certain situations, you're constantly keeping your nervous system in a wired up space. Have you seen people who, you know, you, you touch them a little bit and they have this startled reflex. I've seen it. Like even if when my dog barks and I have some, you know, guests at home, Listening to his bark, they are startled. He is just barking. He's not com coming to bite. But the bark is enough to create a startled reflex in a person. Now, this is where the electrical synapses are working over time. Okay. Then we come to, oh, now this is a very, this is a favorite uh, part of uh, the class. Is now we have to also understand what is DNA, what is gene. And what are chromosomes? Very simple, actually. So what are they? Now we have a cell. This is a regular cell. Nerve cell, the neuron has those dendrites and everything. It looks a little different. But most of the other cells in the body look like this. Simple. It has cytoplasm or like, you know, these liquidy stuff on the outside. It has a cell membrane. And inside is the nucleus. Nucleus is like, almost like the brain of the cell. Now, inside the nucleus, okay, when you see with an electron microscope, you're able to see lots of these, you know, like uh, if you see a grandmother who is knitting a sweater, she will have four or five colors of yarn. But all that yarn will not be tied in, you know, maybe in circles. It will all be jumbled up at some point where four or five colors are mixed together. So like that, inside the nucleus, there will be these, you know, threads all mangled and intermangled with each other. That, my dear friends, is the mangled threads are the chromosomes. So in a human body, we have 23 pairs, like humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes, out of which 22 or what we call autosomes, and one pair is sex chromosomes. And imagine all of these are present in one cell. That means every cell of your body has this same set of chromosomes. It's like a blueprint of who you are. That is why, you know, we know that, uh, you know, when they do, uh, you know, when, when they solve crime, they just take a swab from your cheek you know, and you find the DNA, right? And which is very, uh, which is unique to you. So every person has their own DNA imprint. So here, these mangled uh, threads are the chromosomes. How many of them? 23 pairs of them. But when this cell is getting ready to divide, okay, now cells divide. So, for example, imagine this is a this is a ovum. Okay, now we are women here. So we have released this one egg, okay, in this menstrual cycle. Ovulation has happened, and we have released one egg. Now, this egg here becomes a single egg. That means the chromosomes here are not 46 in all they become 23. So half of that comes to form the egg. Let me know if it gets a little confusing. So one particular cell has 46 pairs, but when it is getting ready to divide, these mangled uh, threads, they join to form this X-like structure like this, okay? And like these, you will see 23 pairs in one particular cell nucleus. So now this is one chromosome. Now what is this chromosome? This chromosome is made up of, again, I said these are threads. 
So these threads, you know, they turn around on themselves. I'll just show you another picture maybe for clarity. Ha. So like this. So if you see this, these, this is the chromosome. The whole thing is the chromosome. But when you open it up, it's like this winding, you know, like spring telephone, you know, the old telephone springs we had like that. And what is this? This is nothing but coiled DNA. So when DNA coils and comes together and forms this compact structure, it's called chromosome. When it opens up, this is coiled DNA. Now, what does this DNA look like when you go deeper into it? It looks like this double helix okay it has this double helix form we all know this we have seen these now what are genes then one part of this coiled dna is called gene so many many genes are present in this chromosome you get what i'm saying so genes are nothing but they are parts of the DNA. So if you look at this other, um, if you look at the earlier picture, it's the same. So you, when we open up this chromosome, you get a ribbon-like structure, which is the DNA. And one segment of that DNA is the gene. And now genes, where are these genes coming from? We get one half of our genes or one half of our DNA comes from our mother and one half of our DNA and comes from our father. So imagine all of your genetic makeup is coming from your lineage. That means from your mother's side and from your father's side. So that is the reason why some of us, you know, when we look at the baby, we say, oh, the eyes look just like her, her mother's eyes or the facial features look like the daddy. So many, many of these genetic markers come from either the father or the mother. Now, another simple thing that you need to remember here is when you look at, uh, when you look at these double helical structure, there are four bases on which, uh, on, through which the proteins are formed. So they are called, they are just four of them. The names are adenine, cytosine, thiamine, and guanine. Okay, you don't have to remember all of them. But remember them as AT and CG. AT is adenine will always combine with thiamine. So how do you remember it? Apple tree, AT, the apple on the tree. So A will always combine with T and cytosine and guanine, that is the car in the garage, C and G will combine with themselves. Now, imagine different sequences, permutation combinations of these A, A, T and C, G is what creates one part of or one segment of the DNA, which is a gene. And like these, many genes form the entire DNA complex. And together, the whole DNA complex is a chromosome. Okay. So I'll just show you a video, which will just kind of clear it a bit. So I don't know if this will open up here. I don't think it will open up. I'll show it to you at the end. All right. And what do genes do? Genes are supposed to... Now, the gene has no direct effect on our body. But gene helps to produce proteins. Okay, it, put, it puts together these different components and creates a protein. And that protein has an effect on us. Okay, so sometimes we hear of genetic mutation. So genetic mutation happens because of certain chemical uh, signal or certain other emotional signals that tells the gene to kind of uh, create a different kind of protein. The gene itself is not bad. The gene is as it is. It has come from the mother. It has come from the father. And sometimes there are gene mutations which can create mutated proteins, you know, so that therefore 
certain illnesses form in our body. We don't have to go into the details of it now. So why is this important for us to, why is important, why is this knowledge important for us to understand our subconscious mind? So Bruce Lipton, he, he was a cell biologist, okay? And he was, he is actually, and he has done PhD and he did number of experiments. If you are a very, you know, science nerd, please go and watch all his videos and, you know, read his book, The Biology of Belief. It's amazing how, He's, he teaches through the biology how our subconscious mind kind of controls us. Now here, what he says is that we are completely under the power of these signals. Okay, Whatever signal comes, now the nervous system will behave in that manner. Any, any signal, a particular signal of, of danger, of fear, that comes in will create those kind of neurotransmitters in our body. But the way we behave, the signal is coming from an environment, from a particular environment. Now the environment, many people say, oh, but if the environment is not good, then we are getting these neurotransmitters which are harming our body or the signals that is creating harm to our body. But if the environment is good, that means we are all in a good shape. But he went a step further. So, so to explain that, he gave what is called, and he gave a wonderful example, which I'm going to share with you as well now. Uh, before that, we'll, we'll do telomeres last. So what was the example? The example was, Okay, I'm going to stop share because this is like a little story. Huh. So what he said, there were two friends. Okay, Let, let's say uh, Sita and Gita. Okay, now Sita and Gita, uh, what did she do? Sita and Gita were taking a walk one day outside their house. Sita lived in a separate home and Gita lived in a separate home. Both have different upbringing. As they were walking on the street, both of them saw a snake on the road, a big snake. Now, as soon as Sita saw the snake, she got very frightened and she said, oh my God, there's a snake. And she was so afraid and she wanted to run away. Whereas Gita's reaction was completely opposite. She saw the snake and she said, oh my God, what is this? Is this a poisonous snake? Is it not a poisonous snake? She was observing. She observed all of it and she realized, oh, it's not a poisonous snake. And she was okay about it and then the snake went its way. Two people, two women in the same situation. That means the snake is the signal. Okay, that means the snake has given the signal to both these women, Sita as well as Gita, that a snake is available in your environment right now. That means the impulse, the information has gone to the nerve cells of both of them has gone to the brain of both these women, but their reaction is very different. Sita's reaction was that coming from a space of fear, whereas Gita's reaction was coming from a space of curiosity. Now, how and why did this happen? Sita grew up in a household where the belief that they held was that all animals are not to be kept in the house. Animals are dangerous. Wild animals are wild. They will bite us. They will eat us. They are predators. They can harm us. So she grew up with this understanding or the belief that this sna all snakes harm us. Nobody told her that there can be poisonous or non-poisonous snakes and whatever. So it's a very unconscious belief that she has taken into her mind or into her subconscious mind. So as soon as she saw the snake, even though the event was the same, the environment was the same, the message from the brain was, oh my God, it's a snake, run away, it will harm you. This is Sita's brain. We come to Gita. Now, Gita grew up in a house where her father and her mother both were nature lovers. And they taught, took their children to zoos. They went on holidays where they took snakes and, you know, you, you place the snakes on your shoulder and you take pictures and all of that. So Gita never had any fear of snakes, but she was taught how to recognize poisonous and non-poisonous snakes. 
So as soon as she saw the snake, she never panicked. She just saw and she said, okay, it's a non-poisonous snake. It will do no harm to me. If I don't harm it, it will not harm me. So she had the knowledge about snakes and immediately her brain never uh, sent her into a fight or a flight mode. Now, in both cases, event is the same, environment is the same. But the reaction of both the women is different. Why? Because of their belief system. Now, women, it is time for us to check in. Every time we have this fearful space that we are operating from or we are in this ikdam fight mode, I want to be this activist, I want to do this, I want... You have to check in and see where is it coming from. Is it coming truly from my old belief system that I am under threat? Or is there a real threat? If there is a real threat, yes, you will pay attention. But if it is coming from the environment which you, which has been created from an old story that is playing in your subconscious mind, then it is time for us to reprogram our mind and to recreate a new story. Okay. So uh, let's move ahead. So he calls this epigenetics. That's a separate topic in all uh, by itself. It's a, it's a long uh, topic that we can do next time maybe. The secret of life is belief. Rather than genes, it is our belief that control our lives. What do I believe? Do I believe I will get sick? Then I will get sick. Do I believe that, uh, you know, the COVID... Uh, virus can affect me. If you see most, most of us who have taken the vaccine, okay, many of us have taken the vaccine. The vaccine itself doesn't have, uh, you know, the, the, the coronavirus. It is a lookalike of the coronavirus. If you, if you have learned about it, it is a virus that mimics the coronavirus. And yet in our mind, we know that when I take two doses of vaccine, I'm going to be protected. It's not going to affect me. And that's what has happened. That is the placebo effect. We all know it. Even as medical doctors, we were taught the placebo effect. And it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. If it's serving you, it's good, right? Okay. Now, one more point about telomeres. Okay. So these are... Uh, these are things that, you know, these are kind of um, uh, topics or names that you hear very often when we talk about mental illness, when we talk about, uh, you know, spirituality and all of that. So telomeres, what are telomeres and, men, and why they are famous, you know, because they are associated with aging. So if you have long telomeres, you are supposed to age very slowly. Okay, you want the shorter telomeres means you're going to die off fast. So what are these telomeres? So look at this chromosome now. You remember the earlier slide I mentioned, the chromosome is nothing but they are strands of DNA just jumbled up into each other, okay? So you can see it. It's like grandmother's yarn waiting to be knitted. And the ends of this yarn, the ends of it, it has to end somewhere, right? It cannot, it's not like a noodle which is... Uh, it's just turned on itself. It's not. There are ends. So those ends are called telomeres. Okay. Now these telomeres, they are a little more sturdier because uh, what they do is it protects the ends of the chromosomes from getting frayed or tangled. To give you an example, now we have hair. Okay. We all have, you know, different hairstyles and whatever. Sometimes when we go to the, you know, we go to the parlor or maybe for a haircut, you know, the, the beautician or the lady will say, or the, or the gen, whoever's cutting your hair, say, oh, you have split ends. You know, have you heard of this? Split ends. That means the hair at the end has frayed or it has split because either it has become too dry or you use too much of chemical or there is a shortage of, uh, you know, vitamins in your body. So when, so even telomeres can get frayed or, you know, broken at the end. So to protect them, there is, uh, you know, we have uh, telomeres, which are actually repetitive DNA sequences, which are present at the chromosome end. So these are kind of little thicker, they kind of hold, hold the chromosome in, in place. Eventually, over time, they every time the cell divides, 
what happens even the chromosome divides from 46 uh, from 23 pairs okay one part of it goes into one cell and one part the other part goes into the other cell so every cell will have the dividing cells will have only one set of of uh, chromosomes one uh, one part of the chromosome like this you know what we call the chromatid it gets separated over here it divides into this two so these telomeres every time a cell undergoes division then eventually they go on becoming shorter and shorter and then the cell can die the, the shorter it gets the cell will die now telomeres are special dna the same thing so they keep the chromosome from getting frazzled and damaged now why telomeres are important because we are, we all want want to live long and you know so what are the interventions that are known to slow telomere reduction what are they eat folate rich food folic acid okay now many of many of the women here who who have been pregnant at some point in time and have mothered babies you know that as soon as you get pregnant the doctor will tell you start taking folic acid tablets iron tablets multivitamin tablets so folic acid is known to protect these telomeres keep stress at bay why because we are we don't want to be releasing all those adrenaline noradrenaline cortisol all those heavy neurotransmitters which are keeping our nervous system on the edge okay fiber rich food um, also adequate exercise all of this now we discussed about exercise during our neurogenesis class and optimize vitamin d now vitamin d why is it important because vitamin d assists this whole uh, calcium levels in our body and uh, we've really not gone into the detailed working of the nerve cell but neurons need calcium ions along with sodium and potassium ions to pass these messages around so calcium plays a very important role in transmitting these messages okay calcium ions so when we are in the sun okay now now how does this translate into into daily work so when you see somebody who is feeling mentally dull is feeling you know too much of anxiety is feeling depressed and low you know that their nerve cells or nerve impulses are ekdam very low level now to heighten it what do you do put them on a folate rich diet get them out to exercise in some form simple walk maybe take them out in the sun let them receive a lot of vitamin d the vitamin d then will you know help in production or maintenance of calcium levels in the body all of this works together see every time people say you know do lifestyle changes go do exercise go eat this but we don't know why we have to do it so what we do we don't do we end up not doing even i i would start doing the exercise and everything and then i don't do it but now when i know very clearly how each of this is responsible for maintaining the health and the chemistry and the electrical impulses in my in my nervous system then i will jolly well do it even if i don't feel like doing it okay i'll do it because i don't want to be you know in this dull drab mode i want to be alert and i want to be awake my nervous system i don't want to be in this fight and flight mode all the time afraid and fearful but in a more stable and balanced space right and that's the reason why we need to do all of these lifestyle changes okay so we are at 11:48 i'm going to quickly take you through the the second part of the session which is now we learned about the subconscious mind that how the subconscious mind is getting programmed which is coming from the programming of our parents from the programming of how we grew up okay in the first uh, in from our childhood for 12 to 15 years whatever programming was given to us that is a program which is playing on autopilot in our subconscious and unconscious space now how do you reprogram because our conscious mind is very little it's just maybe you know the tip of the iceberg 
the subconscious and unconscious is almost 95% of the bigger chunk. So how do you reprogram? So Bruce Lipton says there are three levels at which we can change the conditioning of our subconscious mind. Level one is we get conditioned when we were in the womb of our mother till seven years of age. So what he explains is a child till the age of seven years of age is living at, at, uh, uh, at, uh, at a stage where the brain waves are in theta level. Okay, I explained last time brain waves. Theta is where the child is always in an imaginary mode. We watch children playing house house or they do they have tea parties or they do, you know, I'm cooking food, but there is no food. They're just imaginary game. They're playing the game. So till seven years of age, the child's mind is, is the creative and imaginary mind. So everything, it is just absorbing, absorbing, and whatever it's watching outside, it's absorbing. That means, suppose there are certain behaviors which are not right in the family, even those are getting absorbed. So good behavior is also getting absorbed. The negativity is also getting absorbed into that child. So the child's subconscious mind is getting conditioned till seven years of age. Now, the level two is from seven years to 12 years of age. How does a child learn? Child's learning after seven years, mostly when you're in school. Now you're teaching them how to ride a cycle. You're teaching them to read and write. Most of it is done through practice, right? You're practicing, you're repeating. Even in schools, when you have exams or they have to learn a poem, they're repeating and learning the poem by rote learning. Read it again and again, over and over again. So from two years to se from seven years onwards, we learn through practice and repeat. Any form of skill that you want a child to inculcate, like singing or using an instrument or getting into a particular sport, all of that is learned through repeat and practice. And level three is what we call super learning. Super learning is within 10 to 15 minutes, we are able to reprogram the subconscious mind. And I'll come to that. So in level one, how do we reprogram our mind now? We have to take our mind to the level of theta brain waves. Theta brain waves are um, the, the hertz at which they vibrate is, I think, four to eight hertz, if I'm not mistaken. I'll post that picture on the group. So what can you do? How do you uh, train your subconscious mind? Use suggestive affirmation. If you have grown up feeling, I'm not beautiful, I'm very dark skinned, I don't look pretty, I'm good, not good enough. Mother kept on telling me that you are one useless fellow, you're one useless woman, you're a useless girl. So I want to change that program because every time I'm doing something, I feel useless, I feel miserable. How am I going to change? You can record your affirmation in your own voice, play it. You know, put to put on your phones and keep listening to it just before you go to bed. While you get into bed and you're going to sleep, you slip from beta level waves to alpha waves and into theta waves. And, and when you are at theta waves of the brain, what happens is whatever you suggest gets picked up and absorbed by the brain, by the subconscious mind very easily. So whatever you suggest, oh, Evelyn, you're too beautiful. Oh, you're successful. You will, you are an amazing personality or you're this, you're that. Whatever you want to be suggested, you can do this. Suggestive affirmations before bedtime and on waking up. Don't just write affirmations and stick them everywhere. Of course, it is entering the subconscious mind. But suppose you hear them and you repeat them. You, that is level two, where you are repeating and you're speaking loudly or you are writing, that is in level two. Now, this level one is just listening. You have something called bineural beats, okay? I'm sure you've heard of them. If you've not heard, they're available on YouTube. Now, what are bineural beats? One side, you, you play them on the earphone. One side, uh, the beat is at 100 hertz. The other side, the beat is at 300 or 400 hertz. Now, one side, it's beating at 100 hertz. One side, it's beating at 400 hertz. The brain is very confused. Ye sunu ki ye sunu, ye sunu, ye sunu. So what it does, it automatically cancels it. 
hundred, four hundred minus hundred, and the brain comes to a level of three hundred hertz, somewhere in between. Okay, because now what this is doing, it is allowing that critical filter to get separated between the conscious and the subconscious mind. And at three hundred hertz, you go deep into whatever is your, uh, you know, your theta level and the very low level. Your brain then starts settling down with the bineural beats. No, it's not three hundred actually. Maybe we hear at you know forty hertz and sixty hertz. Minus करेंगे तो ten hertz. Okay, like that. That was a wrong example. So your brain then goes into theta level or even lower delta level. Okay, which is again deep sleep. Where the body actually undergoes lots of regeneration, new cells are formed, any illnesses are healed, all of that happens. So there are also something called music for DNA healing, solfeggio scales. Okay, I personally listen to this guy called Glenn Harrell. We hear angel music. Okay, whale sounds, dolphin sounds. All of this is known to act and bring your brain to the theta level. hypnotherapy again one very important uh, methodology or a tool uh, you can always go to a good hypnotherapist when you see that there are certain patterns in your life are not changing only like you're unable to uh, you know get across them like certain fears phobias all of that you can undergo a very good uh, hypnotherapy session even sound healing with tibetan bowls which i do the tibetan bowls will again take you into a very deep state of relaxation and bring the brain waves into theta and delta level you can also do something called self hypnosis so there are lots of tips which can play and they can take you into a very deep state so this is how you condition your subconscious mind for level 1 that is what all conditioning went while you were in your mother's womb till you till 7 years of age then you go to level 2 is how you can study or reprogram your mind using your conscious mind now very consciously you want to tell yourself okay every day i feel like doing exercise but you know what when i wake up then i'm like nahi yaar mujhe nahi karna hai aaj my body is aching ye ho raha hai wo ho raha hai mujhe nahi karna i mean i for one have been doing this yo yoing for a long time so i push with my conscious mind but after a period of time you know all of a sudden again i've gone into that same lull now how to keep this going so what bruce lipton says is it is habit habit formation practice repeat practice and habits in itself is a big topic which i propose to take for the next class where Uh, there are two uh, very good authors one james clear whose book i'm reading right now i mean it's amazing he according to his name he is james clear and he's really brought a lot of clarity into my own life when we work on creating a daily schedule see your, your brain functions in a very straight jacketed way anything out of out of that you know the mind gets affected it's not a very feminine way of being so we have to learn both feminine as well as the masculine way which we will also learn about but here when we are training the brain any form of training is rigorous it is about discipline it is about persistence it is about being very focused okay so many of us have heard of these 100 days practice 21 day programs 28 day program 30 day program focusing on gratitude okay meditation that we do but with an intention don't just just simply sit to meditate hold an intention so when you're holding an intention your meditation practice will actually bring it into being our conscious mind is a creative mind when i consciously create see we have all watched that law of attraction wala uh, video the secret and this and that i want to manifest this in my life that in my life but we have to be very clear what i want to create if i already have a car do i need another car you know so very consciously you have to create now what you want for your life what is the kind of life that you want to live you know and maybe we will do one session only on creative uh, visualization so for example if you are reading a self help book the conscious mind has understood it but but the subconscious mind has has not learned anything okay so 
what do you do you not only read the book you make notes of it you may go and listen to the author's videos or audios or you can hear a podcast so you're doing these repeat learning constantly and that is what is changing your perception so for me the biggest one was about changing my money blueprint now we grew up in homes where our parents my parents were working for a company so they believed in getting money every month at the end of the month or at the beginning of the month where a salary would come okay it's a very different mindset so the understanding is i have a finite amount of money or isme se hi i have to spend for the rest of the month and from this only i have to save some money for my daughter's wedding i have to save money for education for this for that so it's a very uh, the consciousness is only this much is available for me and from this consciousness i had to move into the abundance consciousness which says there is enough and more for everybody so when we are in lack consciousness i am always trying to grab from others or i am very stingy and i don't want to share okay but when i am in abundance consciousness i feel oh, there is enough for everybody what's the competition all about it's okay we can manage all of us all of us can enjoy the party all of us will have enough and more but to shift from that old mentality to the new there was a lot of work that had to be done and i'm still working on it because automatically because the old programming is so strong that even if you are in an abundant space all of a sudden you will go back into the old autopilot mode if you are not in awareness so you have to be that is why the buddhist monks you know they keep telling you before enlightenment chop wood carry water after enlightenment chop wood carry water but this time you are while you are chopping the wood you are truly chopping the wood you are present you are never ever going to chop the wood and cut your finger because you are so present you will never make a mistake okay and carry water like pay attention you are carrying the bucket you you know like that minute to minute awareness is very important i have not arrived there friends but we are all on that journey and that's why we are learning together okay in the last slide is super learning now what is super learning you can immediately change old patterns within 10 to 15 minutes using these tools and we have lots of these practitioners even in our group here eft emotional freedom technique we have body embodiment techniques okay which we use in in sacred feminine practices emdr which is using eye movements okay there are specialized uh, please go to therapists who are trained don't go to any untrained uh, boogie woogie fellows and you might you know end up with more problem than uh, getting healed breath work different kinds of breath work holotropic breath work then there is uh, you know pranayama and then there is body work like you, yoga different kinds of asanas body massages all of these can change certain subconscious programmings within 10 to 15 minutes so this is what bruce lipton says is super learning okay so yes this brings us to the end of today's session i know it is very uh, heavy a lot of word heavy uh, knowledge heavy but i'm sure quite a lot of it has you know entered your space and uh, i was thinking of picking up habits as the topic for next week but of course in the group we can discuss and we can decide what we want to do so this kind of brings us to the end of the session today ladies i'm going to stop the recording